We all mentioned Amel Emily Wakdawa, who's going to come up and give her presentation right now. Hello, <laughs> my Pluto. So it's about been about five years since Pluto was demoted as a planet, and clearly a lot of people still care quite a lot about that. Um, they actually have an annual protest up in Seattle about how Pluto should be a planet again. I especially like the kids. However, I think that even if there are people out in the how many of you think Pluto should be a planet? Okay. I, I think that you're protesting the wrong thing if you're talking too much about Pluto. Um, and so what I would like to begin to do is make a little, just give you a little context here. How many of you think Pluto is the same size as Earth? How many of you think it's the same size as Mercury? How about over here, uh, Rhea? That's Rhea. No, that's Diony. Diony, same size as Diony. Europa? Nobody's guessing. Okay. <laughs> Pluto, down here. That's Pluto. That's Europa. It's about the same size as Europa. There are 16 things in the solar system that are larger than it. It's not too small. It's not too big. It's kind of kind of intermediate in here. And but I think that we should be talking about more of these other things. I do want to emphasize that I think that Pluto and Charon are very cool. Um, it's the biggest binary in the solar system. They've got at least three other moons. There, there might possibly be a ring system over there, which is extremely cool, although it's very hazardous for the New Horizons spacecraft. But there's a lot of other really cool things out there in the Kuiper Belt, including Eris, which is, of course, the one that demoted Pluto. Um, it's about as big as Pluto, but is much more massive. It's incredibly reflective. It's very dense, and it also has a moon. Then there's Haumea. I really like Haumea a lot. It spins once every four hours. It's also got two moons named Hiiaka Hi and Namaka. Um, it's football shaped because it spins so fast. It's made almost entirely of rock, and it has a whole family of friends that are orbiting along with it in the Quaker Belt. And then there's Sedna, which is really bizarre. It's quite large, and it's absolutely the only thing in its part of the solar system. It is way beyond the Quaker Belt. It doesn't get anywhere close to Neptune. And, you know, maybe this thing is clearing its orbit. I have no idea. So I want to say, if you think Pluto ought to be a planet, I think all of these things ought to be planets, too. Uh, Don't you think? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. 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 All right? Yeah. Anything so? Midgets. Or planets. Plutoids. Well, I still think that that's the wrong question. <laughs> and the reason that I think it's the wrong question, you might uh, understand where I'm getting to, because I had a previous slide that showed a lot of other rather interesting things in the solar system that are neither planets nor Kuiper Belt objects, and that's all of these things that I've circled in orange here. There are an awful lot of really big, very spherical, very interesting worlds that are not planets, and they're not orbiting in the asteroid belt or in the Kuiper Belt. They are moons. And I would say, won't somebody think of the moons? <laughs> because really, they are very, very interesting worlds. They are very large. A great many of them are much larger than Pluto. They have very interesting geologic histories. Some of them may be active today, like, for instance, Europa. And if James Cameron thinks we ought to go there, don't you think we all ought to go there? He's a pretty smart guy. Right? There's a great big ocean under there. It's um, got very active geology. It's got all of these ridges and troughs. It's only got a few craters, so we know that it's been active rather recently. It's got a, quite a source of heat underneath from all the flexure it gets from Jupiter, so there might be oceans under there. And then there's Titan, which is the second largest moon. It's larger than Mercury. It's got a huge atmosphere. And because of its lower gravity, if we could get there and we could flap like little wings, we could fly all over the place on Titan, which would be awesome. And then there's just Enceladus, which is incredibly cool. It's a dinky little place. It's got these huge geysers shooting salt water from its underground oceans into a ring around Saturn. That is really very cool. And then there's Ganymede, which, if it weren't for Europa and Io being right next to it, would be like the most awesome moon in the solar system. But it's just, it's constantly being shown up by Europa. Um, it's got its own ocean. It's got a magnetic field. It's the largest moon. And then there's poor Ceres. Oh. Poor little Ceres. It's only 1,000 kilometers across. It's half the size of Pluto. It's the biggest asteroid. It is spherical. And we actually have a spacecraft that's going to go visit it. So these are all incredibly cool worlds that we would like to visit. And this is a problem. Let me explain to you why this is a problem. Because one of the most exciting missions that's happening right now is Dawn. Okay, It's orbiting an asteroid, Vesta. It's about to get to another asteroid in a few years, Ceres. And we have another one that's on, on the way to another dwarf planet, and that's New Horizons. Now, 
the reason that I say that this is a problem is because these are the most compelling future targets for space missions. We're gonna, we want to go to Titan, we want to go to Europa, but people don't think they're important because they're not planets. They are never going to be planets. So I'm charging all of you to go out there and proselytize and evangelize about how cool all of these moons and Quaker Belt objects are because that was the place, that's where we've got to be going. That's where we've got to be excited about for future space exploration. So that's my show. Society. Thank you very much.